पृथिवी शांतिरंतरिक्षक शांतिर्दशातिरवातर दिशा शांतिरग्निशातिर्वायुशातिरादिशाते चंद्रमा शातिर नक्षत्राणि शातिराप शातिरोषदय शातिर्वनस्पत शातिर्गशातिरजा शातिरश्वशाति पुषाब्रह्मशातिर्ब्राह्मण शाति शातिरव शातिशातिर्मे अस्तु शांति मे दे बी पीस ऑन अर्थ एंड इन द स्काय मे दे बी पीस इन द वॉटर एंड इन ऑल डिरेक्शन्स मे दे बी पीस इन द प्लांट्स इन द ट्रीज एंड इन एनिमल्स मे दे बी पीस इन द हार्ट्स ऑफ ऑल बीइंग्स मे दे बी पीस इन एवरी वन एंड इन एवरी सुखिन सो सर्वे सन्तु सर्वे भद्रा पश्य कचि दुख भाग भवस्तर तो दुर्गा सर्वो भद्रा पश्य सर्वसद्बुद्धिमानों नंदतो मे ऑल बी हैप्पी एंड हेल्थी मे ऑल सी व्हाट इज गुड एंड मे नो वन एक्सपीरियंस मेजरी मे ऑल ओवरकम देयर ऑब्स्टिकल्स एंड अक्वायर गुड टेंडेंसीज मे पीपल एवरीवेयर फाइंड जॉय एंड फुलफिलमेंट let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts a good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point that point can be our own breathing let us therefore practice breathing with awareness as we breathe in let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love strength and compassion and as we breathe out let us release all the stress anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind let us practice this way for a while Let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart. Although God is present everywhere and in every one, the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our own hearts. We can meditate in any way we have been taught. To remain focused, we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name. Let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of god in our hearts
शांति 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 हरि हो
Good morning. Christ is risen. Um, today I will read excerpts from The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Kempis from chapter 10, Appreciating God's Grace. Why do you look for rest when you were born to work? Resign yourself to patience rather than to comfort, to carrying your cross rather than to enjoyment. Always take the lowest place and the highest will be given to you, for the highest cannot exist apart from the lowest. The saints who are the greatest before God are those who consider themselves the least. The more humble they are within themselves, so much more glorious they are. Be grateful for the least gift and you will be worthy to, to receive a greater. Consider the least gift as the greatest, the most contemptible as something special. And if you look to the dignity of the giver, no gift will appear too small or, too, or worthless. Even though he give punishment and scourges, accept them because he acts for our welfare and whatever he allows to befall us. He who desires to keep the grace of God ought to be grateful when it is given and patient when it was withdrawn. Let him pray that it return. Let him be cautious and humble lest he lose it. From chapter 11, few love the cross of Jesus. Jesus has always many who love his heavenly kingdom, but few who bear his cross. He has many who desire consolation, but few who care for trial. He finds many to share his table, but few to take part in his fasting. All desire to be happy with him, but few, refu few wish to suffer anything for him. Many follow him to the breaking of bread, but few to the drinking of the chalice of his passion. Many revere his miracles, few approach the shame of the cross. Many love him as long as they encounter no hardship. Many praise and bless him as long as they receive some comfort from him. But if Jesus hides himself and leaves him for a while, they fall into complaint or deep dejection. Those, on contrary, who love him for his own sake and not for any comfort of their own, bless him in all their trials and anguish of heart as well as in the bliss of consolation. Even if he should never give them consolation, they would continue to praise him and wish always to give him thanks. What power there is in pure love for Jesus, love that is free from all self-interest and self-love. If a man give all his wealth, it is nothing. If he do great penance, it is little. If he gain all knowledge, he is still far afield. If he have great virtue and much ardent devotion, he still lacks a great deal, especially the one thing most necessary to him. What is this one thing? That leaving all, he forsake himself, completely renounce himself, and give up all private affections. Then when he has done all that, let him consider it as nothing. Let him make little of what he, others may consider great. Let him in all honesty call himself an unprofitable servant. Then he will be truly poor, stripped in spirit, and with the prophet may say, I am alone and poor. No one, however, is more wealthy than such a man. No one is more powerful, no one is more freer than he who knows how to leave all things and think of himself in the least. From chapter 12, the royal road of the Holy Cross. Why then do you fear to take up the cross when through it you can win a kingdom? In the cross is salvation, in the cross is life, in the cross is protection from enemies, in the cross is infusion of heavenly sweetness, in the cross is strength of mind, in the cross is joy of spirit, in the cross is the highest virtue, in the cross is perfect holiness. There is no salvation of soul nor hope of everlasting life but in the cross. Arrange in order to suit your will and judgment, and still you will find some suffering must always be borne, willingly or unwillingly, and thus you will always find the cross. Either you will experience bodily pain or you will undergo tribulation and spirit of your soul. At times you will be forsaken by God, at times troubled by those around you, and worse, you will often grow weary of yourself. You cannot escape, you cannot be relieved by any remedy or comfort, but to bear with it as long as God wills. For he wishes you to learn to bear trial without consolation, to submit yourself wholly to him so that you may become more humble through suffering. No one understands the passion of Christ so thoroughly or heartily as the man whose lot it is to suffer like himself. The cross, therefore, is always ready. It awaits you everywhere. No matter where you may go, you cannot escape it. For wherever you will go, you will take yourself with you, and you shall always find yourself. Turn where you will, above, below, without, within, and you will find the cross in everything. And everywhere you must have patience if you wish to have peace within and merit an eternal crown. If you carry the cross willingly, it will carry you and lead you to the desired goal where indeed there shall be no more suffering, but here there shall always be. If you carry it unwillingly, you create a burden for yourself and increase the load, though still you have to bear it. If you cast away one cross, you will find another, perhaps a heavier one. Do you expect to escape what no mortal man ever can? 
Which of the saints was without a cross or a trial on this earth? Not even Jesus Christ our Lord, whose every hour on earth knew pain of his passion. How is it that you look for another way other than this royal way of the Holy Cross? <clears throat> Indeed, the more spiritual progress a man makes, so much heavier he will frequently find the cross, because as his love increases, the pain of his exile also increases. Yet such a man, through aff though afflicted in, in many ways, is not without hope of consolation, because he knows that the great reward is coming to him for bearing his cross. And when he carries it willingly, every pain of tribulation is changed into hope of solace from God. Besides, the more flet the flesh is distressed by affliction, so much more the spirit is strengthened by an inward grace. To carry the cross, to love the cross, to chastise the body and bring it into subjection, to flee honors, to endure contempt gladly, to despise self and wish to be despised, to suffer any adversity and loss, to desire no prosperous days on earth, this is not man's way. If you rely on yourself, you can do none of these things, but if you trust in the Lord, strength will be given to you from heaven, and the world and the flesh will be made subject to your word. You will not even fear your enemy, the devil, if you are armed with faith and signed with the cross of, cross of Christ. When you shall come to the point where suffering is sweet, acceptable for the sake of Christ, and then consider yourself fortunate, you have found paradise on earth. But as long as suffering irks you and you seek to escape, so long you will be unfortunate, and the misfortune you seek to evade will follow you everywhere. All men praise patience, though there are few who will wish to practice it. And with good reason, then, ought you, willing to be, ought you to be willing to suffer a little for Christ, since the many suffer much more for the world. Realize that the more a man dies to himself, the more he begins to live in God. And if indeed there were anything better or more useful for a man's salvation than suffering, Christ would have shown, the world, shown it to the world by his example. But clearly he exhorts to his disciples who follow him and all who wish to follow him to carry the cross and say, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross daily and follow me. When therefore we have read and searched all that has been written, let this be the final conclusion. It is through much suffering that we enter the kingdom of God. Thank you. We'll sing the prayer of St. Francis on page 22.
The Easter Message of Immortality by Paramahansa Yogananda, a talk given on Easter Sunday, April 21st, 1935, at the Self-Realization Headquarters in Los Angeles, California. Jesus was both human and divine. It is inspiring to know that we, although human, can also be divine, like him. In Shakespeare's play, Hamlet describes death as the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. But Christ proved that this idea is wrong. Jesus suffered, Jesus struggled, and Jesus won. From the sermons of human frailties, he rose up to declare, I am immortal. Jesus was the ideal sent for us to follow we did not come on earth to enact the drama of life and death in an ordinary way. His mission was to show that what we could do, what we can do, provided we meditate as he did and provided we love God as he did. Whatever is valuable, precious and great has to be achieved through self-effort. It takes willingness and paying the price to become like Christ. When your consciousness is like his, when you are able to give up your life for all, as he did, the infinite Christ consciousness will manifest within you. The unseen will be seen, the invisible will be visible. Worship of Jesus Christ without trying to be like him is meaningless. We should adore Jesus because he gave us an example by which we can pattern our own lives. You think that you are just a mortal someday to be shattered by the hammer of death. Pluck that thought out of your mind and realize your everlastingness. The whole world may not know you, but if Christ knows you, you are eternal. In one sense, God hides himself, and yet he advertises himself in the flowers, in the gentle breeze, in the birds, and in all other lovely things. You do not see his name written there, but you behold a hint of his presence. He says, follow the trail of beauty. I am hidden somewhere in its heart. I am harmony. I am love. I am beauty. I am fragrance. I am joy. The Lord designed for himself some striking advertisements, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Even through you, he is advertising his presence. Your very conscience is the voice of God. The body of Jesus was indeed a vehicle for the infinite Christ consciousness. But to think that spirit manifested itself only in the body of Jesus is to misunderstand God's plan for all humanity. Whenever you do away with ignorance and think good thoughts, Christ is being resurrected within you. That is, the Christ consciousness that was fully manifested in Jesus is awakening within you. Resurrection is not the power of spirit in the body of Jesus only. Spirit is in everyone. Nor does man have to die in order to resurrect spirit. The physical resurrection of Christ was only part of the lesson of his life. Every time you give up a weakness and feel happy in being good, Christ is resurrected anew. You can bring Christ consciousness within you right now. Pray without ceasing for knowledge of God. For your own benefit and joy, you should emulate the life of Christ. You should try to bring him closer. Do not keep him away by wrong thoughts and actions. If you meditate deeply, you will realize him. You will find him. You cannot find him without meditation. You must pray without ceasing, as St. Paul said. When a child weeps, the mother brings a toy. The baby is satisfied and forgets what it had been wailing about. But the child who cries constantly, refusing to be satisfied with toys, forces the mother to remain by his side. So if you want the gift of Christ consciousness, you must be like the naughty child. Throw aside the worldly toys and cry unceasingly for God only. Consume all worldly desires in the fame, flame of desire for Christ consciousness. If you have the intense yearning 
zeal, and ardor by which you can prove to God that you want him more than playthings, he will come. I am telling you this out of my own experience. Christ was not only resurrected on Easter morn, he resurrects himself in the dawn of the awakening of the soul within each human being. Every morning I feel the resurrection of his Christ consciousness within me. Our souls die when we are buried in the tomb of ignorance. Let this be the day of your own Christ awakening. You can not only experience the life of Christ in visions, but you can practice this resurrection every day in your life. First, forget your old weaknesses and troubles. Just think, Christ was resurrected and I am resurrected with him. I am no longer my old self. Become divinely different today. You may believe that you are wicked, but today you can have a new birth. If you believe this, your belief will transform your consciousness. You can be what you want to be, regardless of your past. Persist in your determination. I pray that you believe what I am telling you today. Cast away all your old habits and weaknesses. Feel that today you are resurrected, that you have become divinely different. With Christ, be able to say, I love all. I shall feel happy for having told you this if you are inspired to seek that consciousness. It is not difficult to do so. You will feel great strength of spirit if you can carry out your belief and resolution. In your heart, you must be good to yourself. Forget the past. Will to be the very spirit of goodness. Know that you are good. Why do some people do wrong? Because they don't use their willpower to carry out their resolutions. Sometimes in the morning I make up my mind to do something and then I find I am unable to carry out that plan. But I perform some other good action later in the day to satisfy myself that in some way I have carried out my intention. Strengthen your good resolutions today and carry them out. Be faithful to them. You have dropped your old self. You were dead within the sepulchre of hopelessness. But today, your divine consciousness has risen at the awakening touch of Christ. Behold not this changing picture of life and death, but keep your inner eye on the beam of immortality. It is this most joyous realization that you can experience.
Asatoma Satkamaya, Tamasoma Chotir Kamaya, Brutyorma Amritam Kamaya, Aviravir Maheti, Rutrayate Dakshinam Mukham, Tenamam Pahinityam. May the divine lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the Divine Consciousness fill our hearts and protect us. As we gather here to celebrate this very sacred and joy, joyful day, the, the prayer that we do every Sunday about leading, the Divine leading us from death to immortality, uh, it's, it becomes even more true and relevant on this day that we have seen through the, the music and the readings that we have had, that 
one important way of understanding what happened on this day is in terms of um, victory, victory over death. Nature, once Swami Vivekananda was asked, um, what is life? Um, and he said, life is the, the, the struggle of the individual trying to resist the forces of nature, trying to put the person down. And one of the ways nature shows its force, so to speak, in an ultimate sense, is in the reality of death. And the conquest of that would be a conquest over death. And that is shown in a very powerful way through what happened on this, on this day. So I would like to read to you uh, a section from Karen Jo Torjesen. She is a professor of women's studies in religion at the Claremont Graduate School. So she has this essay in this book titled, You Are the Christ, Five Portraits of Jesus from the Early Church. And in that there is this section called Jesus as Victor over Death and the Powers. So I'll read you a little bit from that. <clears throat> the periodic outbreaks of persecution that racked the churches during the first three centuries forged a powerful links between the crucifixion of Christ and the execution of the martyrs. Out of this experience of martyrdom, another powerful image of Christ was crafted. For the Church of the Martyrs, Christ was a savior, a hero, and most important, a victor. Christians who experienced the political and judicial oppression of Roman power used political and military metaphors to assert that Jesus was not an executive, ex executed criminal, but a victorious hero. The story of Christ as victor was recreated in the drama of martyrdom, and it was there that the story found its most potent expression. In the callous eye of the idle spectator, the events surrounding the crucifixion told the story of a Jesus who was a victim. In the story of Jesus' arrest, Jesus was a wanted man, a fugitive hiding in an orchard outside the city. The secret police penetrated the garden. The fugitive himself was betrayed by a follower and his friends put up a feeble resistance and were scattered. In the trial, he was caught in the machinery of justice a victim of the violence of the judicial process, subjected to chains, scourging, beating, and finally, execution by the cross. The crucifixion was an event of suffering, aloneness, and a final succumbing to death. Not until the resurrection was there a message of deliverance from death that transformed the meaning of the ordeal. The reversal of this story, which cast Jesus as the victor, tells the real story from the standpoint of the persecuted church. The garden was a preparation for the contest with death. Jesus prepared like an athlete, praying, gathering strength, building concentration to be ready for the moment of the conquest. When, the death, when death came stalking him in the garden, in the person of soldiers and a band of rabble-rousers. The enemy was engaged and the contest had begun. In the trial, each of the instruments of death was met and mastered, the chains, the whips, the rods, and the cross. Even the surrender to death itself became a turning point in the contest, for by submitting to death, Jesus overcame it. He resurrected body, the resurrected body, like the victor's crown, was the victor's trophy over death. It was the evidence that death could be conquered and that it could not overpower divinity. Christ the victor was more than a savior from death. He was also a liberator from the hostile powers of the sublunar cosmos 
that vast hierarchy of spiritual authorities and rulers that controlled events in the world of change. Paul himself speaks of conversion as a liberation from the tyranny of these intermediary powers of the cosmos. Quote, we were in bondage to the ruling spirits of the cosmos, who in comparison to Christ are, quote again, weak and beggarly. In fact, Christ not only is superior to these ruling spirits of the cosmos, but he also has conquered them and leads them bound as captives in his victory parade. A victorious emperor or general celebrated his triumph and demonstrated his victory over his enemies by forcing them to march in chains in his victory parade. It is this image of a victorious Christ leading all the ruling parts of the cosmos as captives in his triumphal procession that Paul invokes. Here the work of salvation is portrayed as a cosmic drama in which Christ the victor fights against and triumphs over the evil parts of the cosmos that hold humankind in bondage. The vision of Christ the victor eventually was elaborated into soteriology that identified victory over the demons with victory over death and the devil, who had rights over humankind because of sin. As the 4th century theologian Epiphanius put it, humanity, harmed by the serpent, would have been abandoned to death. But Christ, the second Adam, found the strong one, spoiled his goods, and annihilated death, bringing to life humanity who had become both the devil's possession and the subject to death. The image of Christ as victor proclaims a powerful reversal in which the vulnerable, the captive, and the tortured become the conqueror, the victor, and the hero. The drama of the martyr's death recapitulated Christ's victory over death and over the demons. In so doing, it renewed the powerful vision of Christ as victor. This victory over death is a victory over everything that limits us in this life. And as, as the, the readings earlier um, elaborated, the test that we are truly not just believing in something, but truly living whatever it is that resonates with our head and heart, the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of all these great enlightened ones of the past and the present, the ultimate test of how much we have internalized those teachings, how much those teachings have become a part of our life through the way we think, through the way we speak, through the way we relate to the world, that the ultimate test is the test of death. How we will meet this one event among all the uncertainties of life if there is one thing that is absolutely certain about which none of us can ever have any doubt is that one day we will die. Can we face that death and conquer death and the way we do it will show us how much the spirit of Easter lives in our own heart. And that's the message as we reflect and meditate on this, on Jesus and his teachings. This is one thing that we can try to reflect over. What does conquest of death mean? What does conquest of nature mean? That nature tries to victimize us, that we always feel that we are living under laws laws over which we have no control. And what Jesus showed was that now, if we allow the nature's laws to control us, we will forever remain victims, but that we can rise above it. And that's the, 
message of hope. That's the message of strength, which will take us away from all, everything that puts fear in our heart, everything that makes us feel that we are weak, that we are nobodies. So it's a very message that a message that Vedanta emphasizes about strength. And we see that through the teachings of all these great ones across centuries, across traditions, this idea that the, the, the strength is already within us to conquer every challenge that the external world may throw at us. So on this very sacred day, I pray that through the grace of Jesus, through the grace of God, may we all acquire that inner strength to conquer every challenge in our life and to conquer death itself. Om Jananim Saratam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapatme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Mohur Mohu. We'll have the prayer now, then we'll do Sarva Mangala, and then we'll go on the other side. Uh, next Sunday, um, we have a guest speaker. Father Francis Clooney of Harvard will speak on Easter and human transformation. It also turns out that next Sunday is Easter according to the Orthodox Church. So we have a week-long celebration of Easter. So that will be our program for next Sunday. On Wednesday, we will continue the, the study of Katopanishad and the meditations will also continue on Tuesday and Saturday. So let's do the prayer now. <laughs> May the divine being, who is the father in heaven of the Christians, holy one of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the great spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength, freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace, and love. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto all.